welcome uh, Harry Northup, Sergeant Overman, Julia Conroy, who played Julia Conroy, uh, Charlie Haas, one of the writers of the film, Tim Hunter, the other writer of the film, uh, producer George Little, talent scout Jane Bernstein, Pamela Dreyfus, Corey, Michael Kramer, who played Carl, and uh, last but definitely not least, Tom Fergus, Claude Zachary. This feels good. <laughs> We're all, um, are all of you aware of the cult status this film has gotten to? The cult status. So, I mean, it's it's a it's a legendary film for weirdos and punks everywhere. <laughs> uh, I don't know that we're really aware of the cult status. Uh, I, I know it really resonates with teenagers, and yeah. it kind of always has. And I think it's because uh, a lot of us were pretty new to acting at the time, and, and we had a great director, Jonathan Kaplan, uh, and he was really able to uh, make us work to uh, to make the characters real. And I think that resonates with audiences today. Uh, this is a question for Charlie and Tim, uh, the writers of the film. Uh, it was based on a San Francisco Examiner article that you wrote, Charlie, called Mouse Packs, Kids on a Crime Spree. I, uh, I'm very glad to have the uh, opportunity to correct this error, which is on Wikipedia uh -oh. and all over the internet. Uh, I, did I did not write the San Francisco Examiner story. Uh, the San Francisco Examiner story was written by a couple of their reporters, and Tim read it, and Tim brought it over to, we were in Santa Cruz at the time, I was a student at UC Santa Cruz, Tim was teaching film there. Uh, Tim read this article in the Examiner and came over and saw me one day and said, you know, this could be an exploitation picture and we could write it. Um, How closely was the script based on the kids that you met? Everything in it had some basis, in fact. The, 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 uh, the, the, the kids had done versions of virtually everything that's in the picture and, and, uh, and except, and the kids had gotten together in Foster City and invaded a, uh, a, a community PTA meeting and to protest and, uh, and to make, make known their frustration that there was nothing to do in the town. They did not set a fire, set, take the place apart, but, uh, but we needed an ending. So. <laughs> uh, for the actors who played the teens in the film who were here, I, I wonder what the experience was like for you. I mean, imagine it was really, really fun, but was it as, I mean, do you, was there any shenanigans going on? <laughs> to find shenanigans. <laughs> were we not legal activities perhaps? No, I think we were pretty reasonable kids. I, I, you know, speaking for myself, I was, I was pretty much in awe of the whole situation to begin with, and I, I just remember feeling like this was a major opportunity, uh, and I, I just wanted to make the best of it, and, and it, it was a lot of work, it's not easy to do, and I just remember focusing as hard as I could on uh, doing what I can and sleeping the rest of the time as best I can. So I recall some minor shenanigans. Um, except for trashing the hotel room, which I, I coerced Michael <laughs> into doing. He was so nice, and he didn't really want to do it. <laughs> but we did. We did trash the hotel room at the end of the shoot. But not like Led Zeppelin trash. <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, it was our version of I think there were sunflower seeds screwed about. Just as I recall. One little tiny piece. Uh, you know, we shot around the Denver area, as Charlie said, and one time we were going from, I don't know, from Greeley to Aurora, and uh, Pam, you know, we were in a van, and Pam handed me these uh, earphones. Now, I'm a little bit older than these guys, right? And so all of a sudden it was a cheap trick. And, I, you know, this was what, 77 or 78? And I never had heard of Cheap Trick, even though I had an eight-year-old son, and you know that song, your daddy's all right, your mama's all right, they're just a little bit weird. weird. Yeah. And, and, and you know, the, the music uh, that, uh, you know, I don't know who, you know, Pam may have brought a little of that music to the, to the cast, to the company. The, the entire soundtrack is phenomenal on Over the Edge. Uh, Saul Kaplan's music is haunting. Uh, I haven't heard it in a theater like this for a very, very long time, probably since the original screening. 
uh, and it's just, it never fails to evoke something very powerful. I mean, of course, that involves that I'm in it, but um, just the, the entire, uh, the entire uh, music for the, for the film is phenomenal. I think it has a, a great deal to do with why it's had the impact that it has. The original Warner Brothers marketing plan for Over the Edge made it look almost like a zombie film or a horror film. The posters, I mean, the kids on the posters look like the kids from the Village of the Damned or something. Yeah, but it's not unusual for the marketing department not to understand the film. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's an ordinary occurrence, and that was definitely the problem here, but there was also a timing factor that worked against the film, and the timing factor had to do with the fact that there were other youth films that came out during that period, and, and, and a couple of them, uh, there were violence in the theaters, and the exhibitors were all worried about gang violence. I, I one thing about the marketing that I remember is that you know we wrote it as uh, as called Mouse Packs when we wrote it because of that newspaper article, and you guys always knew that was never going to survive as a title. We shot it under the title On the Edge, and then Jonathan uh, put it together and showed it to the George and some of the studio people, and we were all on edge to see how they would like it. And phone rings and it's George, and George says, "Well." They're going to call it Over the Edge. <laughs> Pamela, Tom, and, and Michael, I'm wondering what, what the experience is like seeing yourself as teens on screen tonight. I was watching it through my children's eyes, who were sitting over there, um, wondering what they were thinking. Uh, if I've traumatized them for life. <laughs> I find the whole thing pretty horrifying, to be honest. Um, it's, you know, it's capturing your, like, your awkward 15-year-old self for eternity. So every, you know, it's, it's hard for me not to, you know, I haven't been in that many films. So for me, this is still a somewhat uh, unusual experience. And, uh, you didn't mention uh, the movie A Rebel Without a Cause as, as the true precursor to this film. Well, I don't really think it was. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, while this picture was about rebellion, it was really, it was, uh, rebel, uh, you know, it was really about what happens to uh, the, the striving of, of communities to be middle class. Um, I just want to add, though, that Jonathan was very aware of, over the, of, of uh, Rebel Without a Cause while, while we were making it. And in fact, Michael wearing a red shirt at the end of the movie is a homage to the Rebel Without a Cause. I remember him telling me that. The casting's amazing. Uh, I guess, Jane, that's for you, right? <laughs> um, I came in really at the very end, um, and I'm not a casting agent. I actually was a graduate student, but I was a friend of Jonathan's. And um, s most of the parts had been cast, and he was still looking for Richie White and looking for help that summer. Uh, the summer that all the casting was being done. And so he said to, to me, um, I'm looking for the new James Dean. Find the new James Dean. And so with a friend who was helping out, um, we started to go to public schools. He didn't want a professional actress in Westchester. And, uh, and that's where we found. We found um, Matt in Larchmont, New York, um, cutting class. <laughs> and, and I have to say, what, that there were, um, it was, really interesting because um, I knew we were looking for the, for the new James Dean. We found lots of kids who were interesting and, and um, had a kind of vitality about them and could answer questions under pressure and talk about what made them angry and you know, the kinds of questions that we asked. But Matt was something else. I mean, as soon as we saw him in the hallway, there was something about him. And um, and I was wondering if that was going to hold up. And then we all met at I guess uh, Vic Ramis's office on Ninth Street in New York, and all the kind of cute kids that we'd seen earlier were crowded on couches in the in the bottom of uh, of this casting agent's um, office. And Matt was at the top of a spiral staircase in a Larchmont nursery sweatshirt with the sleeves uh, ripped off and one foot against the wall and his hand on his hip. And this is a kid who never wanted to act. I mean, it was really rather extraordinary. 
the, the overalls that I was wearing in the film were actually Pam's. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I never wanted to wear girls' clothes, but they made me do it. And uh, as far as Kurt Cobain, I've, I've read that Kurt Cobain uh, loved Over the Edge. And so I think the film is really responsible for at least the grunge wardrobe movie. <laughs> Can you do me a favor? Can you say I'm flashy? <laughs> Please, it's a dream come true.